Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. We've already looked at voltage controlled amplifiers, but we do need something to amplify. So today we're going to start looking at voltage controlled oscillators, particularly ones that generate sawtooth waveforms. So before we dig into actual circuits, let's think about it at a slightly more abstract level. So we have some sort of information that we're putting in that indicates what frequency we want out of our oscillator. This can potentially vary with time, but throughout the lecture, we're going to assume that that's constant. And for right now, just think about this as a number. I'm mixing abstraction layers a bit by labeling this I. As you might guess, we're going to represent this information as a current. And very much like with the case of the voltage-controlled amplifier lecture, what I'm going to show you here is really a current-controlled oscillator, just as in that lecture I really mainly showed you a current-controlled amplifier. And later on in the course, we'll look at current-controlled filters in the quote-unquote voltage-controlled filter lectures. And in all of these cases, it's up to you to place some sort of voltage-to-current converter in the front. And if we input a constant into this integrator, what happens when you integrate a constant? Well, you get some sort of line. Here we'll assume that the input is a positive number, indicating that we'll have a upward slope, but you could also build sawtooth core oscillators that have a downward slope. So what we need to have happen is for the waveform to reset back to zero once it reaches some sort of threshold. And to implement that, we'll put in some kind of comparator that will compare the output of the integrator to the threshold, and when the output exceeds the threshold, then we'll generate a pulse that resets the integrator back to zero. Now that reset to the number zero is kind of arbitrary. If the output is a voltage, you could have an oscillator that goes from zero volts to seven volts or negative two volts to one volt or whatever. Without loss of generality, we'll say it's zero and the circuit I'm about to show you resets to zero. So let's start by focusing on the integrator. I'll generically label the capacitance as C, and here we're using an op-amp and an inverting configuration to do the integration. So if we had the signal actually coming in like that as a current flowing into the op-amp, we'll get an inverting effect. It's going to turn out to be convenient to draw the current arrow going the other direction. So instead of a current source, technically speaking, we'll actually have a current sink. So that way we'll get a output for our sawtooth wave that goes up. Now we will need some sort of magic switch that we'll talk about in more detail on the next slide. For right now, just realize that as long as the switch is open, our sawtooth is able to go up. But when we reset, the switch will close. It's going to short the output to this virtual ground, at which point it resets down to zero and we drain the cap. So we need something that's an electronic switch. So for that, we're going to use a JFET. Now, if you deal with field effect transistors at all, you're probably most used to looking at MOSFETs. Junction FETs are similar. They're obviously in the same overall class of transistor, but they do act differently. JFETs are inherently depletion mode devices. Now, MOSFETs can be either depletion mode or enhancement mode. Most of the MOSFETs you're used to dealing with are probably enhancement mode. So if you think about the voltage between the gate and the source, then if you're thinking about an enhancement mode, you're usually used to thinking about the drain source channel as being off until you start applying voltage to the gate, which opens up the channel and lets electricity conduct across it. JFETs are depletion mode devices, so they act differently. So the JFET is naturally on. So in order to let the integrator do its integrating business, what we need to do for an in-channel JFET is to apply some sort of negative voltage to the gate, because here our source is at ground. And what that will do is that will shut off the JFET. So while the sawtooth is ramping up, the JFET is shut off. When we want to facilitate a reset, we then set the voltage at the gate so that the JFET conducts, and then we want to shut it back off in order to have the output start increasing again. So 
The way that's facilitated is by this 311 comparator. For now, don't worry about the 15K and the 18 microfarad that we have sitting here. Those are to set a time constant so the comparator doesn't trip too quickly. For now, we can think about things as being ideal. So let's open up the cap and imagine that we're shorting out this resistor. This is something you could do if this JFET was perfect. But as we'll see a little bit later, of course, it's not perfect. Now, I've assumed that somewhere else in the circuit, we've created a nice stable 5 volt reference to be our threshold that we're comparing our waveform to. The 311 is being run off a negative 15 volt supply for its negative supply rail, and we're probably running it off of 15 volts for the positive supply rail, but this isn't terribly important for what I'm about to talk about. The main reason I want to emphasize the negative supply rail here is because this has to do with what the output at the comparator is. The 311 has a special kind of output called open collector. And basically what this means is that the circuit designers left the circuit unfinished. They're leaving it up to us to finish the output circuitry. The advantage of that is it gives us some flexibility. So basically if the result of the comparison is a logical false, then the 311 will take the output and short it to this negative supply rail. But if the logical result of the comparison is true, it will disconnect the output and just leave it floating. So it's up to us to put a pull-down resistor here. Well, actually, really, this is acting like a pull-up resistor, but I couldn't stand the idea of writing a resistor here and then putting ground going up like this. Or let's see, I could have put in the resistor and then had it come over a bit and then have a ground like that. It just felt weird to do that. The reason I would like to think about this as a pull up is that zero volts is higher than that negative 15 volts. So I feel like it's really performing a pull up function, but whatever. The main thing to note is that if the result of the comparison is false, and so it does make this connection, the fact that we have this 2K2 resistor here means we don't wind up shorting things out. There is a nice resistance here for current to flow through here without making things too hot. And then if the output is illogical true and this output is disconnected, well, we now have a nice ground reference for what we want to be there. So most of the time, the output of the comparator is going to be at minus 15 volts. There's going to be these brief instances, though, where the output of the comparator will jump up to zero volts. During the time where the output of the comparator is at minus 15 volts, those are the times when the waveform is increasing. But once the waveform exceeds our 5 volt threshold, then the comparator will output a logical true. It will go up to zero. And when it goes to zero, then in that case, the gate source voltage is going to be zero. The JFET goes into its natural conducting mode as far as the drain source channel goes, and then the capacitor is shorted out and we reset. But during the times where we haven't exceeded that threshold yet, those are the cases where the gate source voltage is going to be minus 15, in which case the JFET is closed off, and then the capacitor can have fun acting as an integrator. So let's do some calculus. Not a whole lot of calculus, though. What is the output of the sawtooth waveform? Well, that's going to be 1 over C times the integral of the current coming in. I'm assuming that the sawtooth wave is 0 at t equals 0. If not, it's not a big deal. You could just add a constant for whatever it is at 0. Now, if this was my EC3084 class, I would make a big deal about making sure we put a minus there in case what we're integrating has an impulse function, but we don't need to worry about any of that kind of stuff for this class. Because, although we could make the frequency control current be some time-varying function, for this analysis, let's just assume it's a constant. Well, if it's constant, what happens when you integrate a constant well, this integral is just going to give me a T because that constant pulls out in front of the integral. So what next? Well, let's look at one specific interesting case. What I'm interested in is what the period of the waveform is. Let's represent that as a capital T with a subscript zero. 
whatever the period of this sawtooth wave is, what I'm essentially asking is how long do we need to wait in order for this sawtooth waveform to actually transverse its entire peak-to-peak -peak range. Now, I happen to have set the reset point to zero, and so instead of peak-to-peak, -peak, I probably could have called this something like v-threshold, where this here is the v-threshold, but I wanted to make this a little more general in case you decided to have some sort of other approach where you set this to something other than zero for whatever reason. I want to indicate the entire range of the voltage sweep. It just happens to start from zero here. So I can solve this formula for T0. And in the next slide, all I'm going to do is just flip the equation around so we can write it like this. And now we can ask the question, well, what does this look like for some typical values? The particular implementation being shown here, I've drawn from Hal Chamberlain's excellent book, Musical Applications of Microprocessors. He cites as the source of these schematics, Electronotes, which was a newsletter published by Bernie Hutchins. And you can still, I believe, send Bernie a check and he'll send you a giant multi-foot high stack of loose leaf paper which I put into some three ring binders and that actually takes up two entire shelves in my Vandler office. And that can keep you busy for a long, long time. Anyway, the particular values used in this Electronote circuit, we can see what those values do in terms of figuring out how a particular control current actually gives you a specific frequency that you might want. So here all I used was the relationship that the period of the waveform is going to equal 1 over the frequency of the waveform, and then rearrange the expression a bit. When I plug in the particular values of 4.7n, and in case you're wondering what I'm doing with the n in the middle here, I probably should have mentioned this earlier. Sometimes you'll see people on schematics, instead of writing something like 4.7n, they'll write it like 4 and 7 where they'll take the unit and place it where the decimal point is. So same thing with resistors. Instead of 2.2K, I'm writing this as 2K2. And the reason we're doing this is that if you're making copies, especially with an old kind of photocopier that's not terribly high quality, that's a little rough, or if you're using a blueprint mechanism, it's very easy for small features like a decimal point to get lost. And if a 4.7 nanofarad capacitor accidentally becomes a 47 nanofarad because that dot got lost, or this 2.2K suddenly turned into a 22K because the dot got lost, well, your circuit might not work as well. It might not work as intended if it works at all. It might just not work in any way whatsoever. So this little convention lets us avoid that issue of decimal points disappearing. Anyway, if we plug in 4.7 nanofarad in for the capacitance, and if we plug in 5 volts for our peak-to-peak, -peak, which works because we're always resetting to ground here, well, I wind up with this number. And yes, I'm typically a little absurd and random in terms of how I handle significant digits. Anyway, I just pumped that into Octave, and it said 4255391. All right, now let's see what kind of current we might need to produce a particular frequency. If I just rearrange this expression here a bit, I can see that to find out what current I need to generate a particular frequency F0, all I need to do is multiply by the peak-to-peak -peak voltage and then multiply by the capacitance. Well, if I place those numbers in for, say, 220 hertz, which is the A below middle C, and if you're not familiar with those particular musical pitch terms, don't worry about it. It's just some frequency that you can find on a piano. Anyway, if you plug in all of those numbers and multiply all of that out, I get 5.17 microamps. That's a small amount of current. And don't be surprised by that. The control currents we use in synthesizers are typically fairly small. Remember, something like an operational transconductance amplifier starts to have issues above one milliamp or two milliamps, depending on the particular OTA. So we're not talking about very, very big currents here. Okay, so far I've basically assumed that this JFET is acting as a perfect switch. And it's true 
that you want to pick a JFET that has a very low on resistance. So this is a good conductor when it's on and has a very high off resistance when we don't want it to conduct. So during the part of the waveform that the sawtooth is rising, we don't have some of the charge of the capacitor leaking through the JFET. We really only want that JFET during the reset cycle. And that affects the particular choice of JFET. Now, no JFET is perfect, of course. So what winds up happening in practice is that reset time doesn't happen instantaneously because this JFET isn't a perfect conductor in its off state. And the main issue there is that because this has a finite reset time, if you're not careful, what can happen is your sawtooth may start to go up and then it will hit the threshold. It will start to discharge, but after it discharges a little bit, it drops below the threshold and then it will go back into charge mode again, but it will almost instantly hit the threshold again. The comparator will trip the other direction, so it will start the discharge cycle, and you can sort of wind up stuck up here, which is something you don't want to do. So this resistor and this capacitor wind up forming basically a time constant of essentially a one-shot. And what this will do is it will make sure that the comparator takes a certain amount of time before it can actually start going the other direction after it trips. So by setting this time constant with the capacitor and the resistor, we can have it go up a bit, hit the threshold, it will start to discharge, but the capacitor won't go back into its charge cycle again because the comparator takes a certain amount of time to reset before it can trip the other direction and start that charge cycle again. Let's compute what that time constant is. If I multiply by 18 puff, I wind up with 270 nanoseconds. So that's not very long at all, but it's what we need to make sure we don't get stuck in the zigzag pattern and we can cover the amount of time it takes for the integrator to reset. Now, we're still left with the problem though, which is that this is still a finite discharge time. And you might say, well, okay, so we have a slightly distorted waveform. And to be clear, I'm drastically exaggerating the effect as I'm drawing this. You might just say, okay, well, it's not a perfect sawtooth. It's just slightly warped on one side. Well, the problem is, is that discharge time is the same no matter what our actual frequency of the oscillator we're trying to set is. So for low frequencies, this isn't necessarily a big deal because its discharge time isn't that much compared to the total period of the waveform. But at higher frequencies, this discharge time takes up a big part of the waveform. Sort of in the limit at super duper duper high frequencies, it might even start to look something like a triangle wave. Again, I'm exaggerating this effect drastically. You don't really get anything that looks like a triangle wave. But you see the main problem here. I have this little bit of extra time that's being added onto the period, and it's a more significant problem at higher frequencies. If I had a case where, okay, at higher frequencies, this discharge time happened faster, I wouldn't worry about it so much. So the net effect is, if you don't do anything about this, your oscillator will start to go flat at higher frequencies. In other words, be at a lower frequency than it should be, because this discharge time is taking up a disproportionately larger part of the waveform. Generally, the way to correct this is to make some tweaks to your current generating circuitry, which we'll save for a future lecture. And when I say save for a future lecture, we'll talk about the current generating circuitry in a future lecture, and then I'll briefly hand wave about the needed correction. You can dig into the details of it more if you want. So the output of the sawtooth wave we had here went from zero volts up to five volts, and that's perfectly fine. Generally, you would like this waveform to be centered around zero volts, and you might also want to scale it in different ways. We'll look at circuitry to do that in the next lecture. For now, the main thing I want to talk about before we depart is the particular choice of op amp here, the CA3130. Now, I've certainly seen no shortage of TL070-whatever or TL080-whatever op amps used in integrators and VCOs, but they particularly made an effort to pick a different op amp, so let's talk about why. Now, op amps with BJT inputs don't necessarily have the greatest input impedance. 
the bases of bipolar junction transistors will draw current as part of the physics of how they operate. Now, something like a TLO7X or a TLO8X type op amp is more appealing because they have JFET inputs that have a higher input impedance. And that high input impedance is important because what you don't want to have happen is to have charge on your capacitor that's leaking through the input of the op amp. That's going to make your oscillator go flat because since you're leaking some of that charge, it's going to take longer to hit the threshold. So something like the CA3130, which has MOSFET inputs, is particularly appealing in this application because it has a 1.5 teraohm input impedance. That is an insanely high input impedance. There are some tricky aspects of using the 3130. In particular, the difference between the voltage supply pins can't exceed 16 volts. So a lot of synthesizers will run off of plus minus 12 volt or plus minus 15 volt supplies. But in this case, if you look in Hal Chamberlain's book, there's actually some additional circuitry to provide some limited supply voltages for the CA3130 in particular. If you try to run this chip with a wider voltage supply range, it will not like it very much. The other tricky thing about using the 3130 is that you may have to supply your own compensation capacitor. Most of the op amps you're used to working with have this compensation capacitor built in. The advantage of that is you don't have to think about it. But the advantage of supplying your own external capacitor is that you can optimize this for particular applications.